one and then uh, you know, I'm ready to go. Yeah. Okay, Sridhar, uh, have you started recording? Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Game as well. This is fantastic. Oh God. Uh, Owen, okay, so, so do you want to try sharing your slides? No, he's already okay. sharing. Oh, I cannot see them. What happened? Oh, you others can see it. Okay, so then I think let me just sign off and sign on again. Maybe I can see that. Okay, uh, can we'll everyone just... see the slides? Can everyone see the slides? Or can anybody say something? I can see the slides. Okay. And then I'll just sign off and come back. I'll just sign off and sign on again. All right. See you in a okay. bit. So. Uh, we are really pleased to have Professor Colgain from the Atlantic Technical University of Ireland as the speaker for our session today. So he'll be speaking about whether H0 is a constant or not. So without right. further ado, let me hand it over to the speaker. Okay, okay. So thanks very much for the opportunity to present uh, some work. Um, so as Chet mentioned at the beginning, uh, this Hubble tension thing can be very confusing. Um, people get bogged down in systematics. Um, all over the place. Um, astrophysicists, I think, are worrying about a lot of stuff and that if you come from a theoretical physics background, you tend not to worry about. So uh, I'm not worrying about this. We're trying to see what kind of statements we can make that are probably true. Um, yeah, but uh, I mean, the general picture is that I think cosmology is going through a Cunian shift. So we seem to be in the middle of paradigm shift. Um, so this is Steven Weinberg. This is a nice quote. He's basically summarizing Thomas Kuhn's work, which is on the structure of scientific revolutions. So it's in a period of normal science, uh, scientists tend to agree about what phenomena are relevant and what constitutes an explanation of these phenomena. Near the end of a period of normal science, a crisis occurs, experiments give results that don't fit existing theories. There is alarm and confusion. Eventually there is a revolution. So scientists become converted to a new way of looking at nature, resulting eventually in a new period of normal science, the paradigm has shifted. So th this text in red is very appropriate to where cosmology is at the moment. We are getting, uh, we have different observations that don't seem to agree on the same uh, numbers, like the same values for, you know, cosmological parameters at different red shifts. People are very confused. People are trying to model build. Eventually, you know, if you, you have anomalies and you have them all over the Sorry. place, you, yeah. Sorry, excuse me. I think there's still some people cannot see the screen. Can Srijan or somebody just check it? You see if it's my on my end. Yeah, I cannot Sridhar? see this. Now it's visible. Now it is visible. OK, maybe Sridhar? what I, maybe the problem is, uh, let me just what I'll do is uh, if, 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 if I'm in full screen, is that a problem? Can the others say this, Mayushri and Zenia? Oh, Zenia shall see. Oh, Shristi, can you see it? Yeah. Yes, yes. Now I think people can see it probably. Well, let ah, me see now, if I go to. Yeah, now I can also see it. Yes, very good. Okay, let, let me leave it like this so we can all see it, right? Yeah, yeah. Now I think it's, it's a beautiful quote. Um, it sort of sets the scene. Um, so yeah, it's, and, and yeah, okay. So Weinberg on Kun basically. Now, um, so yeah, this is a talk I basically gave to um, the general public. So a lot of the stuff that we're actually doing, we can sort of convey to the general public. Uh, just to remind you that virtually all light in the universe is redshifted. So uh, astronomers, instead of working in time, they work in redshift. And Z equals zero essentially denotes today. And um, so there's this relativistic formula here in the middle. And uh, one plus C is the square root of one plus V divided by C, one minus V over C. And for like for most galaxies, galaxies are traveling at you know velocities that are sort of about a couple of hundred kilometers per second. So they're relatively slowly moving. Um, and if you expand this guy, uh, you get that basically Z, at least for stuff that's relatively close to us, it's essentially V divided by C. So, um, And just to highlight that some stuff in the universe, for example, Andromeda is actually moving towards us. Everything else in the universe is essentially moving away from us uh, because basically, you know, the expansion of the universe takes over. And then the peculiar velocities or the you know velocities of the galaxies themselves become irrelevant. But Andromeda has a peculiar velocity and it's going to collide with the Milky Way in probably about five billion years. And um, so that's that's the general picture. Um, just to highlight that, uh, yeah, we're physicists and we work on spherical cows. Um, and the spherical cow in cosmology is essentially the friedman lemaitre uh, robertson walker metric, which is essentially this guy here. And um, so we're assuming we're essentially we, we isolate time. Um, and then we assume that we've got uh, symmetries in the spatial directions. And 
the only thing that really is relevant to us is basically this expansion factor or the scale factor A of T. And we essentially evolve that with time. Uh, so the metric I've written down is for a flat metric, but you could have you know, a positively curved metric or a negatively curved metric. And this just adds an additional parameter. Um, but it's, it's a very simple setup. Um, OK. Now, once you assume FLRW, you've got these symmetries. We know that the Einstein equations without symmetries are just, uh, just a mess. Uh, so these symmetries essentially allow you to boil down the Einstein equations to some very simple equations called the Friedman equations. Um, and so basically what I've written in the bottom right here is essentially the equations that are relevant. So H here is, you know, basically what turns up on the left hand side of your Einstein equations. So this is what comes out of the curvature, which is basically A dot divided by A. So this is just essentially the Hubble parameter. So the first equation you find is that H squared is one over three times rho. Now, usually what cosmologists do is basically this rho, which is the energy density, that basically is a sum over rho I. So they basically, they break down the energy density into different sectors. So they use like, they have a dark energy sector. They have, you know, matter, which they subdivide into baryonic and dark matter, they have radiation sectors. But we're, I'm, for me, I'm just gonna keep it as an overall row. Um, and it just makes this, the equation look very simple. And then H dot is the other equation. So H dot is minus a half P plus rho. So we've got pressure and we've got this, this energy density. Again, there would be a sum over this and we'd have indices I, but I'm not going to decompose it into, into sectors. And if you need to, if you wanna solve these equations, you really have to specify what is the relationship between pressure and rho. So, and that's essentially at a given z. So everything here, well, okay, so it's at a given time. Everything is a function of time here. P is a function of time. Rho is a function of time. Time. Um, but we can also, if we work astronomically, we could just, you know, you can exchange time with z. Um, so there's a simple relationship there. So once you've given the, it, what this quantity here is an effective equation of state, which is just a relationship between P and rho, you can basically solve these equations, and um, so they're very simple. And this describes background cosmology. Um, right, so, so that's, that's basically the Friedman equations, quite simple. Um, now, as, as I mentioned earlier on, we make this assumption about this FLRW metric. The, the cosmo this, you know, basically this, at the back end of this, this assumption, we've got something called the cosmological principle or FLRW paradigm which assumes that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic at large scales. And, and typically what the large scales that people think about, cosmologists think about is 100 megaparsecs. Now it could be larger than this or smaller than this, but it's a number of that order or that magnitude. Um, one megaparsec is, is roughly 3.2 million light years. The Milky Way, for just to give some scale for this, like Milky Way is 30 kiloparsecs across. And Andromeda is more or less, you know, like 0.7 or 0.8 megaparsecs away. So you can think of a megaparsec as being the typical distance between galaxies. And, and then what we're doing is we have to go to the distance of Andromeda and then we have to go 100 times beyond. And then we would reach a pristine, you know, FLRW universe where everything is, looks the same in all directions. And no matter where you are in that universe, provided you look far enough out, 100 megaparsecs, you should find it and more or less looks the same. So that's the basic idea that behind this the cosmologists have. Now, we have mapped out the local universe. This has been done uh, using different distance indicators. Now, um, what's shown here is basically a map due to Brent Tully and his collaborators from 2017. What Brent and his collaborators are doing is they're trying to, they're using vis various distance indicators, you know, to galaxies and clusters of galaxies, and, and basically looking at their recessional velocities. So, you know, how quickly they're moving away from us. And some of those are moving towards us, whichever it happens. Now, some component of those recession velocities will be due to the expansion of the universe. So essentially, you, you subtract away that guy. So, you, you know, we know the universe is expanding. You subtract away that guy. And then you're left with these peculiar motions on top, right? So these, these are the motions of the galaxies. And, and what you notice from what they've discovered is basically... Somewhere in the middle here is the local group. So that's basically the Milky Way and Virgo cluster and whatever is close to us. There seems to be a flow from you know, one part of the local universe to the Shapely supercluster, which is some massive supercluster at roughly about 200 megaparsecs. Uh, so again, it's at cosmological scales. 
this is what the local universe looks like. And, and it doesn't look anything like an isotropic and homogeneous universe. There's lots of structure. It's, you know, uh, this is what real science is. Um, so it, it is hard to say it's FLRW. If you ask an astronomer, is this FLRW? I think somebody like Brent Tully would tell you it's not. And we should go further to basically see that we converge to an FLRW universe. But just to stress that the local universe is not FLRW. Lots of nice structure, flows, uh, various things going on. Um, but cosmologists believe that the universe is FLRW. So I need to explain so, so to you. Owen, I, I have yeah. a quick question. So right. is this flow direction, uh, where is it in relation to the CMB dipole? It's more or less in the same direction. Shapely is, you know, it's everything is in this rough direction or rough hemisphere, right? Okay, good. Thanks. And so if you go to Subir's talks, Chet, and what he talks about is a flow that goes off to the Shapely supercluster and then keeps going beyond. And then he, he, he talks about his quasars. Everything is more or less in the same direction. And there was a paper today on the archive by collaborators, I think one of these, Courtois maybe, um, where basically, again, they're finding a flow. They say it's consistent with lambda CDM, so nothing irregular going on, but it's towards the Great Sloan wall. And again, that's in more or less the same direction as well. So if these, these flow, I think the flows in the local universe are, are all going in the same direction, right? This is well documented. Um, okay, so, so you've all heard a lot about the cosmic microwave background. It was discovered in 1964. Um, we know that deep space is, you know, it's full of photons, so it has a temperature, more or less three Kelvin. Um, one thing, you know, okay, we, we've done various studies of the CMB. We started with Kobe, we went on to WMAP, we went on to Planck. And, and, you know, when you study the CMB, the first thing that hits you is actually, you look at temperature fluctuations in the CMB and these photons. The first thing you find is that there's a very large uh, temperature fluctuation, fluctuation or anisotropy um, that is in the millikelvin range. And so this is essentially the, the first thing that strikes you. Um, and, and what we do is that we subtract this uh, large anisotropy. So it's essentially a dipole and we subtract it. And when we interpret that as basically being due a kinematic effect, so it's basically due to our motion with respect to the CMB. So, you know, when we make this subtraction, then we get to analyze all the small little temperature fluctuations that are in the micro Kelvin range. So, so this is something that's sort of, I don't think it's stressed enough. You know, people show you these Planck maps and they sort of say, you know, these are, this is an isotropic and homogeneous universe. Yes, it's true. It, it looks like it's isotropic. Um, it seems consistent with that. Very small fluctuations at the micro Kelvin uh, level. But then there's this whopping big milli Kelvin uh, dipole that has been subtracted to get, you know, to get access to this. And when you subtract that dipole, what you do is you define the CMB as the rest frame of the universe. You can always, no matter what, you know, everything in the universe is in motion. You can just, it's, you know, you can subtract a dipole somewhere and you can define a, a rest frame. And for cosmology, the rest frame of the universe is the cosmic microwave background frame. And we should do all cosmology in that frame. So this means when you go out, if you're an astronomer, what you actually do is you measure redshifts, but those redshifts have to be corrected for the fact that we're moving with respect to the CMB. So everything gets corrected. And then we, you know, once you've corrected your redshifts, we go from essentially heliocentric frame where, you know, where it's essentially the solar system frame to um, you know the CMB frame, we make that correction. Then we can do cosmology. We can use those guys for cosmology. We can fit supernovae, etc. So all of these guys are typically corrected um, on the assumption that you know there's a CMB frame, and that's you know the center of some sort of or that's the basis of an FLRW universe. Um, now lambda CDM itself is quite an amazing model. It's essentially the minimal model that fits the CMB, and uh, the fit is very good. Uh, so we've got all these multipoles. Um, yeah, and it's been a standard model since the 1990s. Uh, if we move on, we move on to the distance ladder. I mean, in recent years, you know, I mean, I think for cosmologists, um, CMB cosmology or, you know, has been an incredible success, right? They've been able to, you know, they've come up with a simple model, the Lambda CDM model, and they're able to give, you know, sub percent level constraints on the cosmological parameters. So they're able to constrain H0, the rate of expansion of the universe, to less than 1%. You know, matter density is constrained also to some relatively small value um, in the model. So it's a very, very successful thing. You know, it, you can take this as a prediction. 
And then you could go off and try to, you know, um, study some other observable and see if we get the same result. And, and this is what Adam Reese and, and his collaborators have been doing. And they've been doing, uh, they've been determining the only parameter they can to determine, which is basically the rate of expansion of the universe, H0. And they've been doing that by building a distance ladder, which is the traditional way of determining H0. Uh, this is basically just a snapshot of how Adam is doing this. What Adam is doing is, I mean, traditionally, what this goes back to Hubble, basically. It's, you know, it's what astronomers have been doing for 100 years when they're trying to get H0. So you essentially use geometric parallax to get the, uh, get the distance to some Cepheid, which is essentially a pulsating star. And then we use that distance to basically calibrate you know, Cepheids. And then we can go further in the Cepheid variables, so these pulsating stars. So that's the, basically the first and second rung of the distance ladder. The third rung of the distance ladder is basically you need to go to Cepheids, extragalactic Cepheids, so not Cepheids in the Milky Way, these are extragalactic ones. And then you need to use them to calibrate type 1a supernovae. And then you can go much deeper um, in terms of redshift. So the, there's essentially three rungs here, parallax, um, you know, calibrating Cepheids, then using the Cepheids to calibrate the supernovae. Uh, and that's what Adam and his collaborators have been doing for the last decade. Uh, just to remind you that these are the pioneers. Some of them are have been forgotten. Uh, Hubble essentially took all the credit for this, but now it's the hubble lemaitre law. Um, so basically it just tells you that, you know, the rate of recession of stuff, V, its velocity is basically proportional to the distance from us. And that constant of proportionality is essentially H0. This is Henrietta swan levet So she was the person who discovered Cepheids. And the other person here is Vesto Slifer, and he was the first person to probably, yeah, he's the first person to basically um, find spectra of extragalactic objects. So basically find stuff outside our galaxy. And so this, this is the guy who's responsible for the red shifts. This is the lady who's responsible for, you know, the distance indicator. And then Hubble's contribution is essentially putting them together. Um, okay, so, right, as I told you at the beginning, uh, the local universe is n doesn't look anything like a, a pristine FLRW universe, so there's lots of structure. And the problem in determining H0 is you, if you have any galaxy, you've got to figure out how much of the velocity of that galaxy is due to a peculiar motion and how much of that is actually due to the, you know, this expansion of the universe. And, and that is essentially the problem. You're going to need a large number of galaxies, anchor galaxies, to do that. I think Reese now has about 42. So if somebody comes to you from LIGO and they sort of say, I have, you know, a, a binary neutron star merger, I have one event and I can give you a determinant of H0 from that. I mean, this is, you know, that's, it doesn't really make any sense because you have to be able to separate what is the velocity, you know, what is the peculiar velocity of that galaxy from, you know, the expansion and you need multiple events to do that. Anyway, so no surprise that, you know, building a distance ladder is very, very tricky. Um, astronomers have been working on this for a century. Uh, this is basically a historical account of the first few determinations. Uh, Hubble was way off. Uh, basically, Hubble had, there's two varieties of Cepheids that basically Hubble had assumed was one variety of Cepheids, so he was off by an order of magnitude. Uh, this eventually got corrected. Uh, then we get some smaller numbers. And what's highlighted here, I think in dash and dark, is essentially 50 kilometers per second per megaparsec and 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Now, so what this means is that, you know, for each megaparsec I go out, the recession increases by a kilometer per second. That's, that's more or less what the unit means. Um, so somewhere between 50 and 100, and we've known the numbers are in there for a while. This is historical stuff. Uh, if you ask any older cosmologist or astronomer, you know, about H0, they'll remind you that, you know, even since the 70s, various groups have been fighting over whether or not it's 50 and 70. So the famous American as astronomer Sandage was in the, I think, 50 bracket, like he, he preferred this 50 number and he was getting results in that direction. Uh, and there were some bitter fights. Um, now, this was cleared up with the Hubble Space Telescope, um, which I guess was launched in 1996. And actually, one of the, the motivations for Hubble Space Telescope was to make a modern determination of H0. So that was one of the key projects and was led by Wendy Friedman. So it's quite fascinating. Um, now, are, are there any questions on this before I go any further? No. Well, let okay. me ask a general, uh, you know, I'll just ask a general question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So ask away, ask away. I think the, the, the story that you told was very interesting. So um, 
So it looks like some of Hubble telescope was uh, kind of crucial in settling this debate between 50 and 100, right? Exactly, that's what I'm going to tell you. Yeah. So, it's, so it's, th that means that, so is it conceivable that we need a new instrument to settle the current uh, issue? And is there an instrument, such an instrument in sight? Uh, yeah, there will be. W first. So uh, this Roman telescope, I think, is going to. So the, NASA has twin satellites. Uh, one is JWST, and the other is Roman, uh, and that's going to come online soon in the next few years. And, and that's going to basically give us. Uh, the quotes are they're going to. They're telling us that we're going to go from samples of a thousand supernovae to a hundred thousand supernovae. Wow. wow. And it's wide field. So basically, instead of you know. Focusing on a particular patch of sky, you you sort of get you know a wide view. So I guess it's just there to collect these supernovae. And there's lots of I think other terrestrial experiments going on at the moment. And yeah, so big big investment, right? But yeah, that's quite, W first, W first, right? It's 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 called the Roman Space Telescope, and um, so okay. everything has been renamed, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, All right. Thanks. Right. Now, ex experiments give results that don't fit, fit existing theories. So, so this is where I think we are at the moment in cosmology. You know, we go back to Weinberg, and Weinberg's telling you what a Kunian shift looks like. We look like we are in the middle of a Kunian shift. You know, the community is split between people who think, oh, there's something going on here, and people who think, well, there's nothing going on here. Um, and they're very cautious. Uh, and they may basically be thinking back to the 70s and 80s where, you know, we didn't know what H0 was, we didn't know if it was 50 or we didn't know if it was 100. And so I, I can certainly understand there's some historical aspects to this. And so since 2000, uh, this is Wendy Friedman on the left, Adam Reese on the right. Uh, Wendy was essentially the lead on uh, this, this HST, Hubble Space Telescope, determination of H0. So the errors here, I think, so and when I think their final results were 72 plus or minus eight. And, and they're using the same method. So they're using Cepheids plus supernovae. And uh, more or less about 2009, Adam Rees picked this up. And for a decade, he's been working on basically whittling down his errors, again, Cepheids and supernovae. So this explains the contraction in the blue. At the same time, we've had WMAP, which is in the black, the CMB experiment. And then we had Planck, and, and what happened between WMAP and Planck is that WMAP only had access to the lower multipoles in the CMB. So if we go back, uh, these ones here, WMAP was maybe out to about 700 or something like that in terms of multipoles. So these are the larger scales. So it basically sees things at the larger scales, but doesn't see things at smaller scales, right? And then Planck has essentially extended this. Um, to the smaller scales. And now we have terrestrial experiments that even extend, you know, they drill down a tiny patch of sky. Technology's moved on a lot. And, and they will give us multiples out here, right, even further. Um, so to smaller and smaller and smaller scales. So there was a jump here between WMAP and I guess Planck. Even at this stage, I think people were talking about something like Hubble tension. There seems to be some sort of discussion on some sort of marginal two sigma thing in the literature, maybe back to 2011 or something like that. Um, but then it was, it was clear with the first Planck paper that there's there's some discrepancy here. It's maybe Reese from 2016, and then it's gone further. The point of this uh, sign plot or dot here is to tell you ACT is basically a separate experiment. It's a terrestrial experiment, um, and it gives you the higher multiples. And if we combine that with WMAP, which gives us the lower multiples, we essentially get a value that's consistent with Planck. So now you've got independent CMB experiments telling you that H0 is from the CMB is more or less 67 plus or minus change. Uh, Reese here is now converged to 73 plus or minus one. I think it's gone further. So maybe that's 2021. So maybe this is pretty recent. I guess this is some plot. Uh, I should say that Wendy has been basically popularizing these plots. And in the middle here, you find a, a new calibrator for type 1a supernovae that Wendy and her collaborators have been working on. Um, yeah, so yeah, and there's some people in Korea that have, I mean, did some of the pioneering work on this, which is kind of interesting as well. And, and there's like a gang of them now working on it. And um, so this gives a slightly different number. It gives something in the middle, 70. But if you look at distance indicators, actually, maybe it's on my next slide. Yeah, so here we are. So this is basically the status as of, I think, March 2021. So this is a nice review by Eleonora Di Valentino and collaborators. It may be difficult to see this, 
But what you see in pink is basically the Planck result. So that's CMB with Planck. And then what you see in the blue is basically Reese. And he's, he was using Cepheids and supernovae. And then we've got a whole load of uh, direct determinations of H0. So these are local determinations of H0 that don't need a cosmological model. And then we've got, uh, you know, indirect stuff that basically needs a cosmological model and makes use of either CMB or BBN or different uh, satellites or different CMB experiments. And, and they seem to be robust, robustly below 70. And the other ones seem to be robustly above 70. Um, and you can see that basically the Cepheid stuff is, I mean, some of these are Friedman. Um, here's Freedom from 2012. So although Wendy is complaining about the need to check these results, I mean, Wendy would give you a very similar result using Cepheids and supernovae. So then the only question is, does TRGB and supernovae give you a, a consistent result? And depending on whether or not it's Reese analyzing it or Friedman analyzing it, you may get slightly different results. But again, this biasing of local H0 to higher values, see, you know, I mean, it's difficult to ignore this. Um, and gravitational waves are not really competitive at the moment. They may be competitive in the future. So it's, it's quite an interesting plot because, you know, what some people take away from this is basically they take away that H0 measured in or determined in the early universe using the cosmological model uh, is, is lower than H0 determined locally in the late universe. So they're talking about the tension between early and late universe uh, observations. And um, there is also an anomaly in weak lensing, <clears throat> which is more or less the same thing. Again, it's an early versus late universe um discrepancy the, this one is now quoted the h0 tension is more or less you know reese quotes it at five sigma he assumes his errors are gaussian and um, so it's it's serious this is i it's somewhere around two or three sigma but what it what you see here is is some sort of s8 parameter which is, is it's got some sort of clustering component to it and it's got matter density in it um and these guys here with these large contours are essentially some local determinations of it. And this 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 contour here, the one on the top, is basically Planck coming from the CMB. So it seems like we get a slightly lower value of S8 in the in the late universe, and people are discussing something called S8 tension. Um, there's some other fascinating anomalies in the CMB itself. So. I mean, this is kind of obvious in some sense once you see this plot. Um, WMAP itself gave determinations of H0 using the lower multiples of the CMB. Planck basically continues this to the higher multiples and it gets a lower value. So if you actually go and split the CMB into low multiples, so up to as far as 800, and then 800 and above, you find discrepancies in the cosmological parameters. So basically, this is, uh, so the red here is basically, you know, the lower parts, the larger scales, basically. The green is the smaller scales. And uh, yeah, there's discrepancies here in what looks like matter density and H0 and uh, sigma 8. And the point of this nice paper by Di Valentino and Joe Silk and Alessandro Melchiori, where they basically sort of say, if you add curvature, it it improves this discrepancy. So there seems to be some evolution across the multiples in the CMB. But if you add curvature, if you allow for a closed universe, then then you can bring these into line. But what you'll notice is basically H0 becomes 50 something and, and Reese is at 73. So that's a huge problem, right? Although you can bring the results into, into line. Now, related to that is this is a plot again I guess three years later, it's a dark energy survey collaboration. They're looking at um, extensions of the flat lambda CDM model. So the flat lambda CDM model is we're assuming an FLRW universe with no curvature, right? Now, when you put curvature back in, which is omega K, and you have omega M, which is the matter density, cold dark matter plus baryonic matter, what you find is your two sigma contours between Planck and late universe observables, they don't necessarily overlap anymore. Now, now, this to me seems alarming, right? It's it's really telling you that you you okay, so, you know. So I, so, sorry, so you know, like missed the point here. So what was the, the what is this left plot? So uh, what are you doing? Uh, the left plot is basically the left plot is basically um, okay. So it's a couple of different probes, 
in the Amiga K yeah, and no, Amiga I'm, 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 I'm not asking for the details of the thing. I'm just asking the overall picture. What you mentioned, what you already said, I kind of missed it. That's. I'm oh, sure. okay. So if you yeah. suppress, okay, if you suppress curvature, if you set Amiga K equals zero by hand, then it looks like CMB is consistent with stuff like BAO and um, so and and you know uh, whatever observables we have like supernovae and redshift space distortions you know these are late universe observables but when you put curvature back in you see there's a discrepancy and but that's so, all but i'm saying that, right so but but why is that uh, alarming because i mean if the curvature is not there it doesn't fit right so what is the problem well it just says that these two data sets don't agree on omega k or, you know, they're, they're, oh, once I the see. contours, you know, ideally you would like to have all your observables agreeing on the cosmological parameters within two sigma. I see, I see, I see, I see. I see. And some people will sort of say, okay, if it's within three sigma, nothing to see here, right? Everything is fine, right? But but this is showing you that basically your contours of two sigma are sort of disagreeing. Now, whether or not you call that attention or not is is another matter. Uh, will data improve? Will those contours contract further to the central values? Will we find this is a three sigma attention at some point? It, but it, again, it, I think the big picture here, Chetan, is that this is again early universe CMB versus late universe. Yeah. But I mean, all assuming lambda CDM. Everything here is assuming lambda CDM. Everything in this slide as well is assuming lambda CDM. This one here doesn't, the local, the direct determinations don't yeah. need to assume that the CDM. So that's the only difference yeah. there. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, the best one that was the one that I wanted to hear because I was, I was not familiar with that. Thanks. Right. So, so what I find interesting here, Chetan, is this is a large collaboration. And usually large collaborations are conservative. But mm -hmm. when you put in a plot like that, mm -hmm. it, it's sort of glaring, right? This is almost like Des saying, you know, there's a discrepancy here. And that's, you know, Des is, I don't know, is it 100 authors on this paper or? Yeah. You know, try and getting that published or at least getting it through your internal processes is certainly interesting, right? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So so what could be wrong? Um and the simplest thing that could be wrong here is that you know Lambda CDM is just a minimal model, and minimal models should break down. We all know that. Um so the debate that seems to be raging at the moment in cosmology, I think a lot of cosmologists and astronomers, if you talk to them and you sort of you say, well, you know, is there anything wrong with Adam Reese's H0 determination? They will say no. Adam has basically covered all the systematics, covered all, covered all their complaints. So what they're really worried about now is sort of unknown unknowns. You know, some mysterious systematic that we haven't thought about, uh, that they can't think about, and Adam can't think about, and that's where we're stuck. Um, but they don't. I don't think they, dis they question that there's a discrepancy. They're not questioning the discrepancy. It's just whether wh what is the origin of that? Is it basically the model breaking down on one hand, or is it some unknown systematic that we haven't thought about? And, and so, something we've been looking at, and this goes back to some work with Chet, and um, is uh, okay. So, I, I, at the beginning, I introduced the Friedman equations. We can go all the way back. And I told you cosmologists like to decompose this. We're not going to decompose this. We're just going to assume that everything is a function of T. And we're just going to treat these as functions on the right hand side. And, and instead of T, I'm going to work in redshift. So P is a function of Z. Rho is a function of Z. Z equals zero is essentially today. So it's basically just like looking back in time. Um, OK, now if you introduce a, a function W effective of Z, which is a relationship between P at a given Z and Rho at a given Z, you can solve the Friedman equation. So this is something that Chetan pointed out to us, um, which I think is maybe in Weinberg's, you can tell us, is it in Weinberg's book or not, Chetan? Something you I mean, picked up. About the first, no, I mean, that's just the integral of uh, a Friedman equation, right? Yeah. Right, it is. It's a very nice way to look at it, right? So, yeah. so, and, 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 Okay, so what's nice about this equation when you solve it, H0, the, this factor on the right-hand side is an integration constant and it's always there. So more or less what it tells you is that if you work in FLRW cosmology, your H of Z is always an overall factor called H, with the H0, the rate of expansion, and another function of Z, which cosmologists typically call E of Z, they denoted E of Z. So to give you an example, the lambda CDM model or the flat lambda CDM model is H of Z is H zero 
and then there's a square root and then one minus omega m plus omega m one plus c cubed so it's some sort of function like that where this is only valid in the late universe but that will be enough for what i want to say right uh, so this just gives you a concrete example of what this function would look like if we made a particular choice for w effective of c now yeah, this, this, the interesting thing here is that the H of Z is essentially unknown. We don't know what H of Z is, uh, but we determine it observationally through looking at magnitudes of things. Uh, you know, apparent magnitudes of type 1a supernovae allow us to place constraints on H of Z. So a priori, we don't know what this function is. We try to guess it. So what we do is W effective of Z is some sort of modeling assumption that we make. So that's either you put in the lambda CDM model by hand or you make another guess for a model. Um, now, mathematically, what this equation tells you, H of Z, H zero with this guy, is this integration constant, although mathematically it's an integration constant, you know, for consistency, it should be a constant. It doesn't have to be a constant observation. So basically, if you have a bad model, and you confront it to H of Z determined observationally, you can, in principle, find that H zero picks up Z dependence because you've got the wrong W effective of Z. It's a very simple argument, and we, you know, we can't fight over it. Um, and you can rearrange this equation, and it essentially looks a bit like this. You bring hey, the integration constant to the left-hand side. You have two functions on the right-hand side, one of which you put in by hand, which is, it's not a function per se, it's maybe a family of functions with maybe some constants in there. Uh, so you have some freedom, you know, um, maybe omega m is, is, is there for the lambda CDM model. But, you know, provided the z dependence in the exponential of, or whatever z dependence here balances off with the z dependence here, then h0 should be a constant and you should find that, you should recover that value at all redshifts. Um, so it's very, simple idea um, and at the back end of this is just a completely obvious statement that you know if you have a dynamical model and um, how is it going to break down you basically have to study that dynamical model in different epochs fit the fitting parameters and check whether or not the fitting parameters are the same at all epochs if they're the same at all epochs then that's a good model of course there's errors here so it has to be the same within errors you know if if it's not um you know if we find some movement in these fitting parameters outside of the errors, then it would tell me that there's something going wrong with my model. And um, so this is very, very obvious. You know, dynamical models break down when the fitting parameters, constant fitting parameters start to evolve. Um, yeah. And uh, this is something we've been trying to drill into cosmologists. And yeah, it, it, there's big resistance to this very simple. Um, yeah, it's a very simple observation. Um, now, let, let me give you some I mean, while this is something we sort of reached this conclusion in 2011, sorry, sorry, 2021, right? Um, we started off thinking about whether or not H0 was evolving, um, probably starting from Hubble tension, because like Hubble tension is always told, you know, it's all, okay, what I should say is Reese sort of frames it as an early versus late universe discrepancy. So if you know that H0 is lower in the early universe and higher in the late universe, you know, it's natural to think maybe there's, you know, some sort of interpolating values in between these two. You know, you've got a snapshot, which is essentially CMB, you know, at very high redshift. And then we've got something in the, you know, very, essentially almost at Z equals zero. We've got another snapshot of H zero and it's something else. We should have interpolating values in between. And then this would tell you that, yeah, the model is breaking down. So what's curious here is the Holly Cow collaboration, which later became the TD Cosmo co collaboration. They've been looking at strongly lensed quasars. Um, they, I think all the way up to, yeah, they probably started in the late, maybe 2016, 2017, they started quoting results. Uh, what was interesting is in 2019, they produced the first result that more or less confirmed Reese at 73. So they, they but if you look at their values for the, so what they have, uh, okay, so let me explain what's in here. So they had six lens systems, and then there's an additional lens system due to the dark energy survey, which is this one in Cyan. But what they do is they assume that basically I can just combine these, and that there's a horizontal line that goes through all my H zeros. So they combine all of their H zeros. Some of them are high. This one here may be above 80 kilometers per second per megabarsec. Some of them are low. And then when you combine them, you get something that's close to 73. Um, 
But I mean, in the in the in the paper, this paper here, Wong et al., which is you know their original paper, I guess, that confirms Reese. In the appendix, they produce this plot and they show that basically the H0 seems to pick up, you know, it seems to depend. Uh, actually, oh no, wait a minute, this is not in the Wong pa paper. This is sorry, in the Millen paper, which is based the later paper by the same uh, collaboration where they're looking at systematics. What they did is they added this uh, additional lens. So they looked at systematics and they confirmed that there was no obvious systematic that explained this, this trend. And it's it's of low statistical significance. It's less than two sigma, but it's you know it's something you could look at. And um, so we were interested in this, and then we basically produced an analogous plot to that using cosmological data that we basically just combined in a very um, like it's just like a cocktail of cosmological data, different observables, including type one a supernovae, and then uh, varying acoustic oscillations. There's different observables the cosmologists work with. Uh, we essentially just bin them according to redshift, and we've made inferences within the Lambda CDM model. Uh, so this assumes Lambda CDM, that assumes Lambda CDM. This guy here is basically a local determination that is more or less cosmology independent. It's, it, it, what it does is it, it pushes this up towards 73, and some of our descending trend here is actually driven by this data point. If you took it away, then the significance of this result would, would decrease, but still you have something. Uh, so we didn't think too much about this. It's just a cute little plot. Um, there was other things we were trying to say in the paper. Chen can tell you about them. I mean, basically, the early dark energy is is probably a little questionable. Um, but uh, what was interesting is this, there's this um, Italian group who basically picked this up, or at least this line of inquiry, and they noticed that if you take you know type one A supernovae, uh, in particular the Pantheon data set. And they, what they did is they noticed that H0 seems to have some Z dependence. You know, basically there's some evolution in H0 with Z. I think they were interested in selection effects. Is there, you know, something that's biasing my supernovae? And if you talk to the authors of this paper, and Marie is one of our collaborators uh, now, Dainotti. Um, like, I, I think Maria would say this is selection effects. This is, you know, some observational thing that's impacting supernovae. But then it makes you question the whole Hubble tension thing, you know, it's you know, just observation or, or what. Uh, this is a paper actually that's related to FLRW. Uh, it's Dominic Schwartz and his collaborators. But what's interesting about this is this plot again, which is, to me, I found very interesting. Um, what it shows is basically these are essentially, this is a mega M. Uh, and again, it's the Pantheon sample. So what they're doing is binning it according to redshift and fi fitting the parameters. And what you find is Amiga M uh, in low bins is more or less consistent with Planck. It's consistent with 0.3, what you expect. There's some like you know fluctuation here, but then Amiga M sort of goes up at the end. And as a result of that, H0 goes down. So this is the difference in H0, delta H0. So with respect to some reference value, um, which I think is basically Reese. So it sort of decreases. Um, at higher redshifts. So the question is, what's going on? Is that a selection effect? Is that you know something that we should worry about? You know, some systematic in the observations that we should really think about, or is that you know our cosmological model breaking down? Right? You know, back to this idea that there's a H zero that becomes Z dependent. Um, so we did some very simple analysis of that. We took the Pantheon sample. We imposed the low Z cutoff, which we just called Z min, and we just start throwing away supernovae. Um, below a Z min. So you start off at you know 0 0.1, 0 0.2. Now supernovae are actually, if you look at the Pantheon da data set and you assign an, if you wanted to condense all of its statistical power into a redshift, you would find that the redshift is 0.3. So it basically tells you that supernovae is actually, it, it favors lower redshift, you know, it explores lower redshift physics more than the high redshift physics. And, and beyond Z equals one, there's very few supernovae that we find, right? You know, these are exploding stars. Basically, you need a, a powerful telescope. You need to basically, it, you know, basically find some hatch of the sky and basically keep observing that and try to find some sort of flash or change in luminosity and something. Um, so a, as you go to high Z, it's very difficult to find these things. And between Z equals one and Z equals two, we basically have like 24 or 25 supernovae. So it's a very small sample out of maybe a thousand supernovae that are in this Pantheon sample. But basically what you find is you, you sort of start throwing away the low redshift supernovae 
and looking at fitting H0 in the high, higher redshift um, part of the, the sample, you find that H0 sort of decreases and you find that omega m increases. So this isn't really a new result. This is basically us sort of confirming what you know, Schwartz has done here and Dainati had in her paper that there seems to be some evolution in H0 through the sample. Um, yeah, but, but as we're throwing away supernovae, you know, our statistics become poorer. And what you're seeing here, this is the central value, but these are the errors. So the errors are inflating. And now if you show this to most cosmologists, what they'll say is, oh, I can just stick H0 equals 70 through that. And I can stick omega m equals 0.3 through that. And, and everything's consistent within one sigma. Um, so, you know, they sort of, it, it, it's, it's of low statistical significance if anything is going on. Again, going back, this again is of low, relatively low, one with two sigma statistical significance if something's going on. Um, are, are there any questions? Is this clear what we're doing? Yeah, let, me, let me just try and summarize. We, we are basically taking a, a supernovae sample that is sort of biased towards low redshift. And we're basically throwing away the low redshift part of it. And this creates a supernovae sample with fewer supernovae, but then it's it's sort of a higher, it, it has a higher effective redshift. And then we're seeing that there's evolution in H0 and omega M. Right, um, okay. Now, this thing also seems to happen in quasars. So again, we we had three distance. We had a distance ladder. Our first rung is parallax. Second rung is Cepheid variables, or it could be tip of the red giant branch. This TRGB calibrator. It could be something else. Then we go into supernovae. Now, then you could try and build. You could try and use quasars, which are supermassive black holes. They're very luminous. We can see them to very deep redshifts, much deeper than supernovae. Uh, you know, we can. You could try to build a distance ladder, a fourth rung, basically using these guys. And this is what Risoliti and Luso have been doing, I think, since probably 2010. They probably started this research program about a decade ago. And first major paper is probably 2015. In 2018, they uh, posted a paper that got, later got published in uh, Nature Astronomy. And what they showed is that uh, they seem to find a discrepancy at high Z. So what this plot is basically, the magenta is more or less what you expect from Planck Lambda CDM. So this is a Hubble diagram, essentially. This is redshift here. This is distance modulus, which is essentially just related to magnitudes uh, up to some factors. The cyan here is, is type 1a supernovae. Beyond z equals 1, they essentially disappear. But the quasars continue beyond that. Um, and so the statements from these papers are basically that type 1a supernovae and quasars seem to agree well with each other in the range up to z equals 1, 0.5 or so. But then beyond that, they seem to disagree on the cosmologic parameters. And so this disagreement is, is the difference between this magenta, which would be the lambda CDM model with canonical values 0.3, and then this black, which is some higher value of omega m. In the flat lambda CDM. I, I may have asked you this before, but uh, are these quasars standardizable at uh, you know candles? That that's so yeah, that's 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 the debate, right? Are they standardizable, right? That's that's the debate. So so I mean, even supernovae, you can ask, well, what supernovae are corrected for various things? They're corrected for color, shape. They're corrected for you know the mass of the host galaxy. So there's a, a step function that you have to take into account, as you know. There's there's no standard candles. Everything is standardizable. And, and the question now is, do our quasars standardizable? Mm -hmm. uh, but you're, the, the comparison you have to make is you have to go back to the 1990s and look at, you know, when supernovae were first discovered. Did we understand color and did we understand shape? No. Did we understand there was a correction for um, the mass of the host galaxy? No. So what we did is we just added an error to take into account all of these things. And, and even when we discovered dark energy, that error was there. So Rizalidi and Luso are doing the same thing with their quasars. There could be lots of things going on. They have a, an underlying assumption to them that turns them into distance indicators. Um, but, and, and they add some error. So there could be some corrections that basically, if we understood those corrections better or we understood the physics, then we would be able to decrease that internal error um 
but 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 there is some intrinsic error. There's, I mean, you can see there's lots of scatter in this. So, so, in so, this so optimistically, uh, they're they're probably standardizable. That's the hope, at least, of these people. Right? I, so, I think so. Now, now what I'm going to tell you is this, Chad. If you take this quasar sample, now it's it gets sparse. I mean, the thing is, if you just go out and you just scan the sky and you look for quasars, I mean, it's typically they're at z equals one or thereabouts, right? They're far away. Um, so this is more or less what this sample is. It's sort of its effective redshift is z equals one. Supernovae would have an effective redshift of 0.3. Um, these are sparse at low z, but still you can start. You know, I can do. I can play the same game. I can take my quasar sample. And now I can start throwing away the supernovae at high Z and just keeping the supernovae at low Z. Now, if I over the full sample, I find omega M is equal to one, I would find this discrepancy. But if I fit it over the same range, you know, maybe 0.7 or 0.8, between zero and 0.8, I have 400 quasars and I do the same fitting, uh, you find that omega M peaks at 0.3. So you get something that's at least consistent with Planck. I see, yeah. So now you have two samples. You have a supernovae sample and a quasar sample that if they have more or less the same effective redshift, they give you 0.3. But the quasar sample, when you basically add in the rest of the sample, its redshift, its effective redshift goes to z equals one, and it gives you a different value. But what I've shown you here is the same thing. The same trend, basically what I'm doing by throwing away the low Z supernovae, I'm basically increasing the effective redshift of that sample. Yeah. And I'm finding the same, you know, increasing omega M zero. And decreasing H zero. So, so to me, it looks like the quasars and supernovae are telling me exactly the same thing. in similar ranges. Okay. Now, uh, yeah, I don't think I've... I've can, I, can I ask a question? Yeah. I mean, why do you stop at Z equal to one for the supernova uh, thing? The... Because beyond Z equals one, there, there's like 25. Yeah, yes, yes, I know that yeah, they're less, but what is the... So suppose you do the same thing beyond Z equal to one. What is the, what is the value of H naught? It'll be whatever we we calculated to be here, right? It's then around fifty or whatever. Oh, oh, so, oh, so that is everything beyond z equal to one. Well, that's everything. That's z min. So everything beyond z. Okay. So yeah, you know, yeah, I misunderstood. Okay, okay. So yeah. So so the, all I'm doing by z min is I'm increasing the effective redshift of the sample. Thanks. Yes. 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 Thanks. But again, I have a much smaller sample. So W first, getting back to the Roman Space Telescope, that's going to give us apparently a thousand times more supernovae. And so we're going to have lots of deep supernovae, so we can play out this game over and over and over again and um, see if it's true. Anyway, so le let me move on. And uh, so this is just some, these are some real observations. L let me make an observation to you that um, is something that has, is not well appreciated, but is true of the Lambda CDM model. And you can see it in mock data. Uh, and to go back, let, let me go back here. Uh, I'll try to finish up quickly. Um, so here, here's what HZ, the Hubble parameter for lambda CDM looks like. So this part, one minus omega M is what we typically think of as dark energy component. We added this in the 1990s. And um, we've got an omega M here and we've got a one plus Z cubed. So at high redshift, this guy is irrelevant. So you get H zero times omega, the square root of omega M times one plus Z cubed. So that, that's all that it is. And, and if you had like an observable, that just just constrains H of Z directly. And if you had that just in some extreme high redshift um, range and you fitted the Lambda CDM model, you would only be able to constrain H0 and Omega M, some combination of it, H0, Omega M squared. But you would know nothing about H0 and you'd know nothing about Omega M. You wouldn't be able to disentangle it. You'd be able to fix that particular combination, but, but there'd be nothing else you could say. Okay. Uh, let's see, right, so that's the point there. Now, so what we're seeing here, this is some mock data. So basically it's, uh, there's the dark energy spectroscopic instrument, which is basically, it's going to give us lots of determinations of H of Z, uh, all the way up to high redshift, like 3.55, so very, very deep, um, roughly at regular ranges. 
And we've we've broken up, it's 29 determinations. We've broken it up into you know, four bins, so more or less eight in each bin or something like that. It's just, or maybe it's seven, 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 eight or something like that. Um, and we've what we're doing here is we're basically um, okay. So we have some, you know, we have some. Uh, okay, so we have some forecasts for how big the errors are going to be. We basically produce mock data based on the Planck Lambda CDM model in each bin, and we produce many, many configurations of mock data. And then for each configuration of mock data in each bin, we fit back the Lambda CDM model. Okay, so it's probably easier for me to show you this this first. Um, and then we'll go over to this and vice versa that are just related. So what, what this shows is that basically if I mock up on Amiga M equals 0.3, and then I basically fit a large number of configurations in the low redshift bin, I get back my input parameters. I, I get back a Gaussian. So the, what this Gaussian is, is a distribution of best fits in different mocks, and they are more or less centered on Amiga M equals 0.3. And that happens in the low redshift bin, the second lowest redshift bin, and in the higher redshift bins, what we find is, you know, there's a broadening of the peak, but the peak shifts towards the left, and there's some non-Gaussian tails that emerge. And, and this, this pileup feature here is just because I, I impose some bounds. So there's a whole lot of configurations that basically their best fit is Amiga M equals one, and, and basically we're just counting them in, in, in this PDF. But... That, that's what's going on here. And, and basically, as you shift, as the central value sh shifts here to the left, H0 shifts in the opposite direction. Um, okay. Now, then you can ask, well, you know, why is this happening? And the interpretation we gave for this over the summer was basically more or less that if we go back to the Lambda CDM model, uh, this is the dark energy part, H0 squared times 1 minus omega M. And the part that goes with the one plus Z cubed is essentially B. So it's H zero squared omega M. So this is the part that you expect to be well constrained at high Z. And so what we're seeing here is more or less that as we go to high Z, this, I, I should say here that what we did is actually we fitted H zero and omega M and then reconstructed A and B. But then when you reconstruct B, you find more or less what you expect, that basically the B configurations, you know, the Gaussian is becoming narrower and narrower and narrower. We're finding better constraints on B. But then on the flip side, we're finding that A is poorly constrained, but that's what you you expect. You you don't expect to constrain dark energy well at high redshift. Um, and it just turns out that basically this, this shift is, um, you know, what looks like a Gaussian here in A and B, modulo the fact that there's some bounds and they're impacting, I mean, this bound here on A, which is essentially, we're assuming that there's no negative dark energy density. Uh, that, that basically turns into this upturn here, but essentially it's what you expect. There's some spread in this distribution of the of of A's, if you like, which were reconstructed from best fits, and then um, in B we expect some contraction, right? Um, but there is a shift here, right? Um, now uh, we tried to look at this. This was this Pantheon sample. Uh, we the difference between here. This is like a one sigma thing. And the analysis we're showing here, so we wrote in this paper in, in June, we did some mock analysis. Uh, we tried to, we, okay, the, first of all, these are different data sets. Um, let me try to explain it quickly. Uh, these are data, so this is type 1A supernovae. This is cosmic chronometers uh, plus BAO, which give me determinations of H of Z. And these are more or less my quasars, right? Um, and what these data sets show, these, these blues are essentially mocks. And so what we did is, let me just explain the basic idea. So I take the type 1A supernovae, the whole sample, and I fit it. And I get best fit parameters for H0 and omega M. So you get more or less omega M is 0.3 and H0 is 70. Then I want to create a whole load of mocks based on those values. Okay. But, but I'm going to create those mocks in high redshift bins, just in high redshift bins. And then what I'm going to see is how far away is the real data um, or, you know, the, the, you know, the, the observed data in the same redshift bin. So what you find is, so this is our result from supernovae. This is essentially one sigma and the other lines are essentially two sigma. So this is like 1.7 sigma or so. 
But what you find is, you know, if you fit the full sample and you get a H0 and omega M, if you then basically assume that those are the values throughout your whole sample and then just focus on the high redshift part, you find that your real values are in the tails of the distribution and they're not anywhere near the central, you know, the center of the peak. So what this tells you in some sense is that there is evolution going on through these samples. And it's not just in type 1a supernovae. It happens in H of Z determinations as well. And in the quasars, it happens the opposite way. So quasars prefer omega m equals one, but at low redshift, you get omega m smaller values. So it's, it's the opposite effect. But again, there seems to be clear hints of evolution in quasars, supernovae, and these H of Z determinations that come from BAO. Uh, and, you know, if you combine them, the statistical significance in each one is, is quite low. It's somewhere between one and two sigma. This is 1.7 sigma. I think this is two sigma. This is about two sigma. You, you get the three sigma, just over three sigma. So there's a one chance in a hundred that, the, sorry, one chance in a thousand that, 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 that this is a fluke. Um, across these three data sets. Now, this may not be clear, but let, let me explain where this comes from. And I can, this is something we realized later. Um, and it's actually, it's not just H of Z data, it's D of A data as well. So, you know, some observables are direct, they directly constrain H of Z. Some other observables, they constrain the integral of one over H of Z between Z equals zero and Z. So this is a, a called an angular diameter distance, and it's related to a luminosity distance by a factor of one plus z squared, I think. Um, but what supernovae constrain is the, the luminosity distance, right? So it's the same thing, right? Now, what you notice is that if you take, um, again, we're playing the same game. Um, this one hand here is, is H of z constraints. This here is D of A constraints, and you find the same shift in the central value with these um, non-Gaussian tails that emerge. Now, none of these peaks are normal. Like, I haven't normalized any of these to one, but what, what's actually happening is, as I told you at the beginning, as I go to high Z, if, and I'm fitting effectively high Z samples, I can only, I can't constrain H0, I can't constrain omega M, I can only constrain a combination. So what you expect is that if you built up a whole lot of mocks, um, so you, you basically generate mock samples based on the Planck Lambda CDM model and just fit them in a high redshift fin, you would expect not to be, you would find, you would expect to find almost uniform distribution of H0 values and almost uniform distribution of omega M values. And so what seems to be going on here is that this shift in the peak of the distribution and the flattening out in with these non-Gaussian tails, that's basically trying to turn a Gaussian at low Z into a uniform or flat distribution at high Z. Now, I, I don't know what the argument is to sort you know, the analytic argument to say how that should happen, but we know analytically it must happen. And what our mocks are saying is it happens in this very particular way. Now, what's amazing about this, it means that even if you assume the universe is Planck lambda CDM, your data is completely consistent with it. There comes a redshift where you can no longer recover the cosmological parameters that you put in. It mean, basically means all bets are off at high redshift. So basically, the, there's nothing to preclude evolution in type 1a supernovae or H of Z. And, and this is precisely what we're seeing. We're seeing that basically this is the evolution in, in supernovae. This, this is a basically DL of Z, which is DA of Z data. This is basically quasars. Again, the same thing, nothing to preclude evolution in that. And then this is H of Z data and nothing to preclude evolution in that. And you see the evolution. Now, the, the catch here oh, is that I, when you... I, I, I'm a little confused about how, how to interpret that. So I would have thought that this means that uh, you basically cannot use data at sort of intermediate redshift. Intermediate means, you know, red of one or higher to constrain anything. That's, isn't that what that means? I mean, why? Right, it, it, so the, but, okay, so, so that's true. But if we go back to the quasar sample, that you could interpret it that way. So the quasar sample actually does give you constraints. You, you have large statistics, right? You find omega m is one, but you don't find your errors are plus or minus 0. 0.7. You find your errors are plus or minus something smaller. Mm -hmm. So the, now you have a discrepancy with Planck. 
a well-defined one. Mm -hmm. so, so you're right. So basically, as we go to high redshift, you know, depending on the sample, we may find that our errors just inflate and everything's consistent with Planck. And it's just, you know, there's got to be spread. <laughs> I, I'm talking about slightly different distributions here, right? So in one, it's basically I, I fit the, the data set. And in another, I'm fitting large realization, you know, a large class of realizations of mock data mm -hmm. and just extracting the best fits. So somehow the statement would be that the quasar data at higher redshift is a very unlikely one. Is that the message in some sense? Uh, and no, actual, actual quasar data, for example. I, I don't know if it's unlikely or not. I'm just saying that basically, even if you mocked up the quasar data on mm -hmm. Lambda CDM, even if it was completely consistent with Lambda CDM, Amiga M equals 0.3, you're unlikely to find that value. You're unlikely, to, yeah. That the value, yeah, so you know, basically that's that's what this is saying, right? So if mega m is 0.3 here, you know, there's some probability of finding yeah, it, but it's okay. much more probable. So it's sort of the opposite of what I said. So in the sense that quasar data is somehow exactly like any mock realization of this. Um, I, I think point. it's. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's difficult to go from mock data to observed data. I mean, the observed data is just one realization, right? But I think what our mocks are showing is even if you had everything completely consistent with lambda CDM and Planck lambda CDM. Then you know the probability of getting omega m equals 0.3 is is much smaller than than you think it is. Yeah. And the only exception to this, um, sorry, Chetan, is if you combine H of Z and D of A data in our mocks. Mm -hmm. And so what's going on here is, and, and you can see it from the integral, right? Um, yeah, so, so that's like a, a scanning all the, the all the Z's in some way. Right. So so more or less what's going on is H of Z data at high Z constrains the the B parameter, which is omega M H zero squared. And this guy D A of Z, because this integral H of Z is increasing, right? It's much more sensitive to the dark energy part. Yeah. So by combining both of these, we get very good constraints on A and B, and we're able to recover the, you know, we're able to recover the input parameters in all bins. Yeah. But Jen, let me stress now, there's no way you can determine Omega M0 using supernovae. Because all you have to do is take the sample, start binning it, and the problem, as you go up in redshift, there's come some point where this, the probability of getting 0.3 is just low. And you get whatever value you get in that redshift bit. You shouldn't expect 0.3. You just have to go and fit it and see which I get. I mean, it's possible there's no evolution. But that's unlikely. And there's no systematics here. There's no corrections. Everything is completely under control. And we understand why it's happening. It's because a Gaussian needs to go to a, you know, a uniform distribution, right? Mm -hmm. And that either, you know, it would either have to flatten where it. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to I'll, 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 I'll probably email you later because I'm trying to interpret what that means, though. I mean, now, I'm if sure. somebody here can give me an analytic argument why this is happening, uh, I would be very, that that's certainly progress. Um, you know, some, I, I can discuss it offline. Um, mm -hmm. Right, but, but again, I don't think we need to, you know, at high Z, we need to find a uniform distribution. H0 and omega M0 are undetermined. You know, any value is equally likely. But at low Z, we, we have nice peaked Gaussians. And so yeah. how does that flatten? And our mocks are telling us it flattens by skewing, essentially. Yeah, please go ahead. I mean, I think I'll ask you questions then. Okay. Right, I'm going to finish. I have some, OK, so this is the summary um, of one. And then I'm just going to flick through some things. Um, do you guys have to go, or uh, do I have five minutes? or? No, I'm fine. I mean, you can go and take your time, yeah. OK, so we have introduced the concept of redshift evolution and provided evidence for it. So again, this goes back to some observations we made with Chetan and, you know, this simple math argument that I think came a little later than the Holly Cow data. We started with the Holly Cow data, so credit to Holly Cow. The funny thing is, like, when we tell Holly Cow, you need to you know, be aware that you may not be able to determine H0. This just gets buried, right? They, you know, they're not open to this idea that H zero may not be a constant, right? 
Now, and let me stress, what they're determining is time delay. Those time delays are related to angular diameter distances. So it's not like they're combining H of Z data and D of A data. They just have D of A data. So it's quite plausible that evolution happens there as well. Um, so this redshift evolution is mathematically expected if the flat, flat lambda CDM model is breaking down. If substantiated, then H0 and SA tensions, I introduced SA all the way back here. S8 is proportional to omega m. Now, if H0 is evolving, omega m also has to evolve. They're kind of opposite sides of the same coin. Uh, one goes up, the other goes down, and vice versa. Um, so yeah, th if that guy's evolving, then S8 has to be evolving as well. Or are you expect an anomaly in S8? And lo and behold, this is what we find. Uh, so this is very compelling for physicists, or should be compelling for physicists, because you have two anomalies, they look different. But, you know, they could be a symptom of the same underlying breakdown of the model, and th this tidies it up. Um, now, let, let me just finish the, the, the talk with, you know, is H0 even well-defined? Um, right, just to point out that some of you will be aware of this, some of you won't. Uh, so we go back to the dipole. Um, various groups have been trying to test this dipole. So we have the CMB, you know, uh, we find a very large temperature fluctuation. An anisotropy that we interpret as basically due to our motion with respect to CMB. Now, are there some distant observables where we could basically test that velocity? Because as you go out, if you know if the if the FLRW assumption is correct or the cosmological principle is correct, as we go out further and further and further, eventually everything is in CMB frame. So, you know, the recession velocities they're much larger than the peculiar velocities. So eventually everything is just in one frame. You you sort of, you know, at low redshift, you need to distinguish between am I observing in heliocentric frame, you know, the solar system frame, or am I observing in the CMB frame? But as you go to Z equals 0.1 or maybe 0.2, that discrepancy, you know, that's a small, very small change in redshift. And it's it's a tiny, you know, it's it's essentially a tiny contribution to the things and it just becomes negligible. So basically what we expect is, you know, if you have a distant observable, that should be in CMB frame. So what people are doing is they're taking radio galaxies and quasars, large samples of them, like a million quasars uh, or a million radio galaxies on the sky. Now, if you have a large sample of them and they're far away and the cosmological principle holds, you expect them to be more or less isotropically distributed on the sky, provided we're in the rest frame of the universe. OK. Now, instead, because we're not in the rest frame of the universe and we're, we're making these observations from the solar system and it's moving with respect to the quasars and radio galaxies, we'll find that there'll be over densities in a particular direction. And, and this is just an aberration effect. So basically what these groups are doing is basically looking at the distribution of quasars and radio galaxies on the sky and basically counting them and trying to find an, a direction where we're finding more quasars and more supernovae, and then from there, basically inferring what our velocity is. So what's interesting about this is basically quasars and radio galaxies, they're matter. So they're essentially, they give you a matter dipole. What we get from CMB is essentially radiation. So that's a radiation dipole. And if everything is consistent, those two numbers will more or less overlap. Um, so the contribution of Subir and his collaborators, in particular Nathan Seacrest and whoever else is on this paper, and has been generating a lot of interest is uh, that there may be a f anything up to a five sigma discrepancy in uh, the dipole that we get, or essentially the velocity that we find. We more or less find the right direction from our quasar sample or their quasar sample. So we 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 agree that we're moving in the the, the direct same direction that the CMB tells we tells us we're moving, but we find the magnitude is different. Um, and I to stress that this, you know, I think this, this, these results go back uh, decades, well, a decade at least. Uh, Ashok Single had a, like a two sigma anomaly in 2011, and then there's various groups after that, Dominic Schwartz, various other people um, studying radio galaxies, different samples of radio galaxies, and eventually that moves to quasars with um, Subir and his collaborators. Uh, so there, there looks like there was an anomaly there. And the simplest interpretation of that would be an anisotropic universe. Um, so meanwhile, in the local universe, uh, there seems to be, as you imagine, it's not FLRW. So if you were basically trying to, you know, we sort of average to get a H0 value. But if you plotted the H0 values on the sky, you should find some variation in them. And this is some work by McClure and Dyer, 
from 2007. So this is basically HST data, so Hubble Space Te Telescope data. It's um, essentially the key project, so it's what Wendy Friedman worked on, and it's it's data related to that. And as you can imagine, you know, there's parts of the sky where basically, you know, you could get 80 for H0, and other parts where you could get, you know, 70. But the error bars are large, and everything sort of overlaps. Um, but the, those differences should be there. There's claims due to Kostlinski et al. Um, that basically, uh, so I introduced peculiar velocities. There was this it seemed to be like a dipole flow from this dipole repeller over to the Shapley cluster. We we call this a bulk flow. It's sort of a coherent flow. So Kostlinski from about 2008 has been claiming that there's a, you know, that basically this flow, it, it should die away at some redshift to meet lambda CDM expectations. What he's find, what he finds and his group finds is that it doesn't. And there seems to be some large outflow in a particular direction. This came up again in basically uh, galaxy clusters uh, just in the last few years. So Costas Midkus and collaborators, they're looking at scaling relations in galaxy clusters and they find you know, that these scaling relations are sensitive to uh, the CMB dipole direction, even though everything, I guess, is corrected and put in CMB frame. There seems to be some residual that's there, uh, again, which then adds credence to the Kashlinsky result. There was a paper today that was sort of saying, you know, that studying, you can have a look at it if you can find it. If you want, just ask me, I'll, I'll dig it out for you. Um, it was saying that everything is consistent with Lambda CDM and that, you know, that they see nothing that Kashlinsky sees, right? Um, so we, we have some funny results, um, some of Chetan and Roya, um, various other collaborators. This is type 1A supernovae. Again, we're doing something very simple. We're taking the sample and just splitting it in hemispheres and then just rotating it on the sky. And you find that you get larger values of H0 in the CMB dipole direction or a, a hemisphere that's in that direction. So it's, it's, it's a very crude thing we're doing. We're just taking a cosmological model. We're assuming the Lambda CDM model. It doesn't really have a direction associated to it. And then just finding a discrepancy in H0. And what's interesting here is we find more or less the same discrepancy in H0 in, in the quasars. The quasars seem to agree that, yes, that particular direction, H0 is higher. So this is a very interesting coincidence between these completely independent uh, cosmological probes. Um, I think in all of these results, what's what's coming out of them is that you know we expect something in the CMB dipole direction. If there is an anisotropy, you know, okay, if simplest interpretation here is an anisotropy in in you know the the Hubble expansion or whatever in in the direction of the CMB dipole direction. Now that's what you know these dipoles tell us. We seem to be finding the same thing in galaxy clusters, and, and it's curious that when you come back to bread and butter Hubble diagrams, type one A supernova, you seem to find the same thing again. So. The, the significance here is very low. It's like, you know, just between this is one is between one and two sigma and the other is just over two sigma. So it's very low significance, but kind of what you expect. It just seems to be consistent, right? Um, so we've got different orders with different probes all pointing to the same thing. Is it a good bet or not? Yeah, I, I think it's certainly something we should look at. Um, and so that's the summary of the second part. The Lambda CDM model currently gives conflicting results. Oh, this is a total summary, sorry. Lambda CDM model currently gives conflicting results in early and late universe. If the model is breaking down, you expect redshift, red, redshift evolution. This is very easy, easy mad argument. Um, you, know, you show this to astronomers and cosmologists, they can't but say, yes, this must be the case, but then they just ignore it. Um, have we ever already seen this? Probably. And you can argue using mocks that we need to see it. And that makes supernova cosmology very questionable. Uh, what are these corrections, right? Are they corrections on top of a base cosmology that you assume is the flat lambda CDM cosmology with canonical values of m equals 0.3? And then you're looking at corrections and evolution in corrections, or should you be looking at evolution in the background itself? Separately independent groups with independent observables of different scales are finding anisotropy. So this is sort of fascinating. Um, you expect FLRW to break at some scale. You know, there's nothing that tells you the universe has to be FLRW. It's just a simplifying assumption. And it's quite interesting that we have a couple of groups now that are basically finding those results. And it's plausible that we're just at that particular point in time where FLRW is becoming uh, obsolete. Um, ultimately, H zero. OK, so the main point here is that H0, you know, if the universe is not FLRW, then, you know, if you look in a particular direction on the sky, you can find one value of H0. You look in the other direction, you can find a different value of H0. 
Um, and, and if we have enough observables, we may be able to see the distinction between those two, right? Because uh, the errors would basically decrease to a point that they no longer overlap anymore. And then you can ask, well, you know, what, what is going on, right? Is H0 even, zero even a good observable? Um, okay, so on that, I'm going to finish. Oh, any questions? I asked a lot of questions. I mean, uh, it was a very interesting talk. Yeah, thanks very much. I, it's know, very provocative and... Uh, no, but it's, but it's interesting. It's, I mean, yeah. It's, uh, it's very it's simple like, as well. I can give this, I gave this talk to a public uh, audience where I was able to, you know, you don't even need physics for this. <laughs> don't need physics, yeah. So, you don't even I need theories, a, right? But when is the, the, you know, when do you, when do you expect to get data from this Roman telescope that you're talking about? I think 2025, I don't know what, the, but it's sometime in the next decade. Uh, so yeah, this decade, it's not too far away, right? DESI is going to have data soon that it's going to be releasing. So this is like SDSS basically gave us BAO as far as Z equals two. We have, you know, maybe, you know, five or six different redshifts. DESI is going to basically give us like 29 different redshifts, effective redshifts galaxies and different types of galaxies all the way up to z equals 3.55 it's going to give us you know so, d of so, a so would you expect that a solution to this question will come up in the like let's say in the next 10 to 15 years uh well i mean i find it like i mean it looks like the lambda cdm model is breaking down right it looks like there's nothing to preclude h0 there's nothing that says h0 has to be the same in the early and late universe i don't see what's People are. So the, the one thing I would say, in some some ways, as a counterpoint, would be that if you have if you have acceleration, there are these cosmic low hair theorem type of things, which kind of there is at least a theoretical reason to think that lambda c, you know, not uh, you know an FLRW type setup may be okay. So in fact, one of the points that we were making in this uh, dipole cosmology paper was mm -hmm. kind of a theoretical statement that this is one of the few counter statements: the fact that flows can. Happens. Right, that is interesting, right? But I expect it to go over the heads of people, right? So like I asked, I asked we, don't, we, we don't have a good model. We don't have a good model. So, I mean, it's a, it's just a theoretical possibility. So, in that sense, I mean, uh, maybe it is, at the moment, it may be okay to ignore it. I don't know. <laughs> so, right. So, no, but, no, yeah, but I do find it interesting that there are, these flows are, you know, like you can have on the matter sector, you can have, a, you know, these dipole kind of isotropies showing up while the metric sector homogenizes. So people always look at the metric part and talk about, you know, cosmic no hair theorem type of stuff, but that's not sufficient to, especially rule out the dipole kind of things that you're talking. Right. About. So it's certainly an interesting result that basically you, you mean, I mean, God, yeah, I mean they're just just ignoring it, right? Um, there's an assumption that this cosmic no hair theorem applies to these I, flows, I that right? Is, that is a question, I think. And, um, there are some questions. I saw a hand up. So please go ahead and ask oh. the question. Hi. Uh, I want to know whether James Webb Space Telescope uh, data can be used to resolve this H0 tension. So JWST is giving us uh, loads of interesting anomalies at high Z. So what they're finding is basically, okay, so there's there's an issue here that the, we're not sure about. Okay, so they seem to be giving, um, we seem to be finding galaxies that are too massive at early redshifts. Now, the, the problem here is that JWST is, it doesn't give you spectra for those galaxies. So we don't know exactly, we, we can't confirm where they are, but we use photometric redshift, so we can more or less estimate where they should be. But this, you know, this already is at odds with Lambda CDM. So there seems to be anomalies coming through JWST data subject to, you know, those anomalies are based on photometric redshifts and we need to confirm those. But if we confirm those, then you would say that, we have too many, um, you know, high mass uh, galaxies, you know, too early in the universe for the flat, you know, for the flat lambda CDM universe. What are those redshifts roughly? I mean, are they uh, so, I mean, anything up to, you know, 11, 12, yeah, 17, there's been even like, and it's all, is it a question of, is it JWST systematics or is it, you know, you really need to get, if you, you see the spectrum of the galaxy, then you could basically nail down its redshift. You know, there's a lot of guessing that goes into, you know, you have some bands that you observe things and you try to reconstruct the redshift from the bands, right? You only observe at certain frequencies, right? Yeah, I think there is another question, or, or is it the same question? So I think JWST is, is, is already giving us interesting results. Okay. 
Question? There is one more raised hand. So see that maybe there's the same hand. No, and, uh, there's another hand, I think. Moistry. Okay. Yeah, please go yeah, ahead. Uh, so, okay. So my question is, uh, can you treat uh, supernova type 1 and supernova to be the standard candle? Because uh, we have observed over-luminous and under-luminous supernovas. So right. Uh, yeah. I mean, they're not standard candles. They're standardizable, right? You correct them. Okay. And then um, I think what people are wondering, so there's an ad hoc correction for the mass of the host galaxy. So it's like a step function. People have mm -hmm. wondered about where this is coming for many, many years. And this debate still rages. It's, I mean, I'm not a supernova person. I'm, I'm is that the criticism that a step you had? Is that the, 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 or the ad hoc step function correction that you just mentioned? Is that the, I have heard f step you criticizing the supernovae or something. Right, so there is an ad hoc, just, you know, if the mass is over this, we basically correct this way, and if not, then we don't. And, and it's essentially empirical, and we just don't understand it, right? Um, I mean, but I mean, a lot of this, we don't have very good understanding of. People criticize the quasar data a lot because um, what you get from quasar data is basically a relationship between UV and X-ray fluxes. You can see that, but then you have to assume that that relationship is coming from some intrinsic relationship in the luminosities. You have to assume there's some, they, they criticize the quasars a lot for this. Um, so the, the whole thing is, it all, there is an underlying assumption that you make. Yeah, I think one interesting thing is that, you know, like the original, you know, like to kind of be somewhat provocative, let's say. So uh, for instance, I mean, the original observation of uh, Hubble, that's just yeah. completely, it's the only thing that really you got out of that was a qualitative observation. Right. I, I think that maybe one thing you could come out of this, which is qualitative based on this somewhat, you know, let's say imperfect data, is this general statement that things have to evolve and FLR will be breaking down. That may be a reasonable claim to make given the sort of uh, imperfect status of data. That's what right, I'm right. So well, I think what the astrophysicists and cosmologists are worried about is the systematics. But I mean, I think we're presenting them with an argument that's sort of like, well, you expect this to happen. You know, and you expect this to happen every few generations, right? Or, you know, once a generation. You know, if there's a jump in precision, what's to say H0 is a constant, right? In FLRW 10, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we should constantly find that H0 is doing funny stuff. And then we come back and we, we look at our cosmological model and say, oh, there's something like that. And at some level, it, God, cosmology just seems uh, like it's just. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, yeah. Was there another question? And then maybe I. I yeah. So I think that, yeah, was that a question? So if not. Or a comment. Question, comment, thoughts. May Uzri, did you want to uh, say something? Chetan. Yeah, yeah. I, I was saying that I have uh, two more questions or you can say clarification and they oh, yeah. might be nice. So uh, the first one is uh, I just want to confirm that uh, you are like you are trying to model omega matter part when you are uh, getting I mean when you are fitting the data from supernova type 1 supernova. So is it because that uh, you have no other window open to uh, remodel uh, Hubble parameter? No, no. So, so what I'm trying to check is whether or not these guys are a constant. So if the model is good, H0 is a constant. And if H0 is a constant, the omega m is a constant. So in the late universe, the only relevant parameters in the flat lambda CVM model are H0 and omega m. So if you start finding evolution in H0, you're going to find evolution in omega m, zero. That's all I'm doing. So basically, I'm that, fitting... That the also can be uh, done in different way in our universe. So, because it is uh, late universe probe, so that is why you are uh, changing right. the so, so, Exactly. Right? So, what, what, what I'm doing is basically I'm using the fact in the late universe we have data at different redshifts. So, basically, the yeah. CMB is basically at a fixed redshift. And, mm -hmm. you know, if the model is breaking down, there's only one place to test that. And that, you know, we expect evolution when the model is breaking down. Where would we test that? We would test that in the late universe because that's the only place where I have enough data to do this. Okay. And, yes, and if I didn't um, find that evolution, if I didn't find that evolution, then I would sort of say this is a systematic. You know, it mm -hmm. looks like the model's fine. We need to go back and we need to, you know, something's wrong. There. It's, it's an observational thing. 
Okay. So my last question. Uh, H uh, Hubble parameter also depends on the the term of dark energy. I mean, there is a term like one plus z to the power one plus omega. Omega is the equation of state parameter. Do you think that changing this equation of state parameter can help? Which which equation of state? You mean in the dark energy sector or the dark matter sector? A yes, dark energy sector. No, I don't think it helps. I mean, I mean, okay. Why I'm studying the flat lambda CDM models because it's very simple. And then if we add an extra parameter or two, then all of my errors would inflate. And then, of course, I can put, you know, H0 would be a constant at all redshifts. Right? Yeah. Um, but the, what we found is basically, even if I relax lambda CDM to W CDM, you're not going to be able to turn a value of 67 into a value of 73. There's nothing you can do there. So it doesn't help with Hubble tension. You still have, would have a glaring discrepancy in H0. It may not be five sigma, it could be three sigma or something like that, but it'd still be there. I, I, think, I think it also try, tries to drive the equation of state more negative, which is always- It does, different. yeah. And actually, this is very interesting because just to pick up on this point, what Hubble tension, what this biasing in H0 tells you is that if you try to change the dark energy sector, you're pushed into the phantom regime. <laughs> And that should freak you out if you're a theorist. Like it basically tells you between the lines that dark energy is not an effective field theory. Oh. It, it okay, is, I understand. Yeah. Right. Yeah, or, you know, it's, yeah, I mean, I don't, yeah. There's, there's some subtleties to this, but it, to broad brush strokes, people who go around sort of saying, I can model, um, you know, dark energy with a scalar, it's, it's it's certainly misguided. Jen, any comment on that? Do you think it's too too much or? Well, I mean, I think there yeah. are uh, some some uh, you know, for instance, you can. There are some models that I have seen which are kind of uh, you know this. I, I'm sure you know this paper, right? Model, where they have like you know late term late time dark energy dark matter type of stuff. There, at least there is there are some models which seem which may be viable. I don't know. I mean, I'm somewhat agnostic, but uh, at least there exists one that I know of. Right, so, so there's models that send H0 in the right direction from Lambda. Yeah, yeah. That's true. They're, they, they have a mild, you know, phantom component to them. But getting something to go very far towards high zero is, is really tricky, right? Yeah. No, I mean, I So, Shetan, are you saying that uh, their modeling can change the Hubble uh, parameter that much? Um, like 67 I'm not percentage. exactly sure whether the value are precisely. I, I think, I, yeah, I think I can send you the paper. So you can just send me an email. Yeah, and yeah. Send you the paper. You okay, can, okay, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can, you can. If you dial W to some very negative value, like minus 1.2, you can get uh, 73 on the nose, right? Yeah. But then, but then uh, BAO. We also should like, understand how physical it is. I mean, uh, BAO prevents you from doing this. No, I mean I think that I think there are you know there are models which are swampland friendly which still manage to drive it not high. So I mean I forget the details. I looked at it some time ago and uh, no no definitely they're there they're there they're there yeah. right. So coupled quintessence does this right. You can yeah, certainly yeah, send so, hate zero in the yeah, right direction. I, I think that is, I, I forget the details so that's why I don't want to say too much. But I do know that they are there. But so so Jen, just one comment on that. Like. Yeah. You really to get the most impact, the most bang for your book, and book well, from a negative W, you need to have the W negative at z equals zero. So what couple quintessence yeah. usually does is basically the W at z equals zero, it's it's above minus one, and then it goes into the phantom regime, and so then you you only get incremental or small improvements in H zero, right? And and that's why that couple quintessence thing doesn't really work. You need to be deep in the you you need to be in the phantom regime at z equals zero. Yeah, you know, which is not physics, basically. Hi, uh, can I say okay. one sentence? Thank you. So I think there is one more question. Maybe this is the last question. I think, uh, you know. No, I just wanted to one know. comment. Oh, recently, there was one paper where uh, instead of dark energy, what they are they're doing, they're saying uh, if we have this equation state for dark matter, that is time dependent. And uh, what they say ki earlier, it is just the W equal to zero, but in the late time, uh, if it go, uh, what they find right. that uh, W goes to in the negative regime, then they can solve this both uh, at zero and sigma eight tensor. So I mean, right. I mean, this was, was this was Eleanor's paper with Joe Silk, was it? 
uh, I forgot the author's name, but uh, this was a very recent paper within, I think, right. months. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so I, this is not surprising. But I mean, I don't think, I think they can alleviate these tensions, but I don't think they can solve them. And, and you need to be wary about how are they alleviating the tension, alleviate, alleviating tensions. Are they expanding errors and moving the central values? You know, are the central values moving a lot or are they moving little? Like, oh, okay. And I think in a lot of these cases, the, the errors, they quote the tensions are less because the errors are just larger. Central values change very little. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. you're not really solving anything. Yeah, oh, I'll, I'll see that. Okay. okay, thanks. Okay, good. I think we're more or less done then, Jen. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah. We got yeah, some questions. Which is good. I think that's a good summary. I also like, and I kind of, I've kind of been slightly decoupled from the story of its attention for the last couple of months. So I kind of wanted to hear something. I, I would be surprised if this is not modern breakdown. It looks like modern breakdown. It smells like modern breakdown. <laughs> God, it's a simple model, right? Yeah. yeah it seems so, almost yeah, obvious. I, yeah, I'm writing many papers saying it is breaking down, but I don't know whether we'll see. I mean, you know, yeah. So we'll see. Okay, okay anyway, anyway, thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks a lot very much.